I've recently published the book Play to Potential, published by Penguin. And in the book, I talk about the framework flavor that we can use to lead a multidimensional life. And in one of the chapters of the book, I profile six different people who I believe are exemplars of leading a flavorful life. One of them is my friend Sumit Mehta, who I've known for 27 years. Sumit is the co-founder and CEO of LEAD, a school tech company, and now is worth more than a billion dollars. First things first, I'm deeply grateful for Sumit because he was the one who actually galvanized my self-awareness journey when he introduced me to the Landmark Forum many years back. A couple of things strike me about Sumit's journey. One is about how he made the transition from a career in PNG in Singapore to what he does now. And I notice that very often when people climb a mountain, there's a lot of celebration of success of the climbing of the mountain, but there's not enough research about how people behave when they are at the foothills of the mountain. Sumit in this conversation talks about how he was at PNG in Singapore and then decided to take a sabbatical, and then try a bunch of different things and eventually leaned into what his heart told him, which was education. So his approach is often a textbook approach to what I tell people when I'm coaching them to pause and then reinvent yourself. Because it's hard to do that when you're running at 60 kilometers per hour. Second, I also find it fascinating that so much of who we are is actually encoded in our childhood. When I work with leaders, I often ask them to do an archeological survey of their childhood. And when you look at how Sumit reflects on his father's inspiration as a teacher and what he is now doing as a co-founder at LEAD, it's not difficult to see what the similarities are and where some of the seeds might have been sown. Without further ado, let's dive into the conversation with Sumit Mehta. Hey Sumit, uh, thank you so much for making the time for this series on the Plato Potential around flavor. i uh, really excited to be talking to you. Thanks Deepak, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I know we, we've crossed paths over the last 25 years. It's, it's lovely to sort of sit in this format and uh, formally discuss uh, our lives and journeys. Uh, but maybe just for the purpose of listeners and viewers who are tuning in, Sumit, it'll be helpful if you can share a little bit of context around uh, where you are, right? Just uh, your professional context, personal context. I think it'll help people understand where you're coming from. Yeah, see, I think uh, personally, I am a father of two. Uh, my my elder one is uh, 16 and my younger one is 14. So uh, we are a household of two teenage kids. Uh, and uh, professionally, me and my co-founder, we are, I think we've taken this audacious goal of uh, trying to transform India one school at a time why am I work as the co-founder and uh, CEO of LEAD. Uh, I think fundamentally, I believe that I would be able to leave this world a better place uh, than I inherited if I can help children become uh, what we say as capable adults, responsible citizens and good human beings mm. through a joyful schooling experience. Mm. Uh, and uh, I feel compelled to do this work in India because I think I, I, I love this country. so. That's where I've chosen to to do this, and yeah. So basically, those are the two things that I contribute, like spend most of my time on. Wow, many many strands to pick here. Uh, country, uh, joyful education. This is what inspires me. We we'll, we'll probably come back to this peeling this uh, later in the conversation, Sumit. Um, but I find that uh, very often a lot of who we are and what we become and what we do is guided by our early years. So you can talk a little bit about maybe your formative years for 15, 20 years, parental influences. Talk, us a, talk to us a little bit about how your operating system uh, might have gotten forged in those years. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, so I, I'll, t I'll tell you uh, a nugget. Uh, hmm. And it, it had not hit me, but uh, Smita asked me the other day, uh, one of our uh, batchmates is traveling to Bombay Boxer, right? So she was hmm. like, uh, who amongst your friends came from a, a, a large city? Mm. And I look back and I realize that most of my friends have come from small towns. Mm. Uh, and it, I, I had never thought about it, but I think it just kind of happened that uh, the stories that uh, attracted me and uh, the stories to which I was attracted were all people who had like similar journeys of 
uh, moving from a small town, mm. facing all the challenges that are uh, there when we move from a small town to a large town. And uh, I think becoming like band of brothers, sisters, whatever you call it through that. So I grew up in a small town uh, and I think it has shaped me in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll talk about it. I'll talk about how. Uh, but yeah, growing up in a small town was... Uh, which was, one? Which, which town was this? The Pathankot, I grew up right? in Pathankot. Hmm. And I think till the age of about uh, 16, uh, it was very blissful. Like I didn't have an idea of what was outside Pathankot. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, I, I was doing well in studies. I was doing well in everything. So there was, I mean, I had not experienced inadequacy uh, till I was in Pathankot. Hmm. And then when I went to Chandigarh, uh, I was suddenly hit by uh, this realization that I had to earn my right to be included in, hmm. in things. This is uh, in your undergrad, huh? This is undergrad. in my engineering college, yeah. Hmm. Uh, and then it, I think in, in a way it got repeated all over again when I went to IMM the, the where people had come from a Delhi or a Bombay. And I saw people doing high fives because they were in the same group discussion, uh, personal interview and test prep classes. And I realized that I had been, I had been pretty naive because I had taken this correspondence course from IMS and, and gotten yeah. into IMS. So <laughs> hey, uh, here. I can, I can relate to all these sentiments. Correct. Yeah. And, and then when I went to Singapore, uh, I think, uh, that's, I mean, so I had carried a sense of unfairness that you know because i was I had grown up in a small town it wasn't fair we had never the same access to resources and therefore in some way i wanted to make it right mm. uh, because i hadn't got it uh, and i think that's a thread maybe which now shows up in what i do mm. uh, the other big influence growing up has been uh, my father i think he was uh, he was a brilliant teacher and one of my earliest memories is that, you know, I used to accompany him to like the market to buy stuff and random people would get up, uh, get off their scooters, stop their come, come out and touch his feet. Wow. Uh, and, you know, they'll be like, sir, I was in your class 20 years back, 15 years back. You said this. What would he teach? What subject did he teach? He used to teach English. But and, and, and then I got the chance to be in his classroom as a student. Mm -hmm. And I saw like how a person can bring any topic alive uh, because they're so consumed by it. Like I remember uh, he taught us this chapter, the gift of Magi. And uh, yeah, I mean, he would just bring the story alive because he was so into it. Uh, I remember him narrating a verse called, Oh, my love, like a red, red rose that newly sprung in uh, June. And then he asked, hey, we were in Punjab, right? Uh, don't you find it odd that a person is using June as like a romantic thing? Yahan pe itni garmi hai. <laughs> uh, but if you go to England, June is like a really good season. And for somebody sitting in Pathan court, like England was, but he mm. would transport us. He would um, us with his students and the magic of a great teacher, I think, uh, mm. I, and I don't think I realized it then, but I was, uh, I was like, I was an audience uh, to mm. just see that. Uh, and the other thing I think, so I, I saw what a teacher could do growing up and, uh, the other thing he did, uh, was he, he used to say some things which have stuck with me. Like, uh, one day he told me that we never show your uh, Janam Kundli to anyone. And I was like, and I like, it wasn't important for me. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he said, we don't, because, uh, I think uh, somebody told us that you are, uh, born to do something big. Now, as a child, when somebody says that you're born to do something big, right, I think you just uh, start expecting a lot more from yourself. Uh, mm. uh, I remember, he, and, and these are verbatims that he's told me 40 years later, they are still alive in my head. Like one day he came and he told me uh, we were sitting on a terrace and he, I was the youngest. My sister is like eight years older to me and he gave us a paragraph to write in English. We were sitting in summers on the terrace and I wrote and he told me, you know, yours is the best out of the three. I've never seen a student like you. Now he might have said that in that moment, but you know, it was like a big thing. So the, the confidence that he gave me to be able to do what I wanted, uh, mm. I think was priceless. Uh, mm. And despite going to an average school in a small town and stuff, the fact that, I mean, the reason that I've been able to uh, do things, I think it somehow somewhere comes from 
uh, the self belief he instilled in me at at some point uh, and my inclination towards education clearly comes from him my desire to do something in small town comes from me growing up in pathan kot all of this of course is true in hindsight it was an evident growing up but i'm sure there are seeds which got sown then yeah of course i mean uh, the one of the things i end up saying uh, given my limited view of the world is while the opportunity that's available to people might be skewed i genuinely think potential is uniformly distributed it's just that different people some people have the ovarian lottery and they end up uh, with different kinds of opportunities but uh, intrinsic potential i think it just uh, it just needs to be the people just need the inspiration right it could come from your father or somebody else i was recently seeing this movie 12th fail with my kids i don't know if you got a chance to see it yeah it's an amazing uh, movie ha uh, and uh, yeah i think they just uh, sometimes if and and that in that case the inspiration came from another uh, of a police officer right sure. so you never know uh, what triggers um moving forward so me i think uh, clearly we 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 were together at ima you joined png you were there for a while i think after that is when i found some of your transitions very interesting right so can you i think uh, i don't want to sort of belabor the sort of the traditional pathways right so i think that's often well understood but talk to us about maybe the key inflection points let's say post png to today and if you could just expand on each of those transition phases what was your frame of mind how did you make choices and how did you get here so i think uh, in early years of png i learned a lot uh, and i loved handling like small neglected businesses and turning them around because there was a lot of autonomy in, to do what i mm. wanted mm. uh but at some stage work became repetitive because i moved to a bigger brand and for some this would have been aspirational because you know you get a lot of attention for me it became very boring because there were global templates to follow there were global guidelines to follow mm. and i started wondering like what am i doing where am i adding value uh how am i making this world a better place uh so then i did the unthinkable because most people would be in the hurry to get promoted i took a sabbatical just to figure out what i wanted to do uh, and i moved this back was uh, how many how many years in into png oh uh, this was uh, i was sixth year i think of being 2005 i took a sabbatical i joined png in 99 hmm uh, and i i was in singapore so i came to india for six months i traveled around the country i taught uh, i uh, consulted a few companies i visited a lot of schools with my dad uh, and i got and what was the and what was the trigger for the sabbatical i, I just want to sort of pause I this and expand i was just not having fun like i i mm. see every day i would ask myself what am i doing with my life where am i adding mm. like, how mm. is my being in this world making it a better place and that was a question that was not mm. being answered and i wasn't having fun so i thought uh, and i didn't know what else i would do so i thought let me just take the time to dabble and try some things and figure out like what did i want to do like where would the gladness of my heart lie Um, and PNG was okay with it because very often large corporations don't have yeah. that flexibility to offer a sabbatical, right? I think in that your... regard, PNG. See, mm. I, I've also realized that if you're doing well, then people mm. are willing to extend. So sometimes I feel that people uh, think too much about what they don't want to do, uh, and that robs them of the ability to do well in what they're currently doing. Because if you if you do well in what you're currently doing, and people are willing to take a bet on you. Mm. Uh, so thankfully, I was doing well and. Uh, and when i asked they were like i asked that i want to leave because i was just unhappy hmm. and they said no stay then i asked can i take some time off and then my manager made it happen so i'm eternally grateful for that opportunity lovely and you and you and smita were you married at that time we were married yeah i okay. i took a sabbatical i came here and then uh, she took like a holiday for uh, two okay. months to join but uh, yeah she, it was largely your sabbatical okay yeah it was largely my sabbatical uh, I think the the one thing I got out of the sabbatical was I got mm. clear that uh, education and teaching was where I could work even if I didn't earn anything. I mean, I just had so much fun. I could see that this is what I wanted to do. And why uh, did you teach? Just to get specific, when you came back? Yeah, so I I was uh, one of our batchmates, Shiv. Uh, yeah, he yeah. Used to teach at uh, some MBA colleges in Pune. So he yes. got me to uh, teach marketing as a visiting faculty in two of those colleges and uh, another another gig. So. I at one point was teaching three classes, different classes, marketing because that that is what I was doing in in PNG. Uh, while I had a lot of fun, I realized that uh, post grad is too late. The basic mm. plumbing is done, and I was I realized that is not. I mean, I was having fun, but I wasn't being able to create impact. 
Hmm. Then my father had retired by then, and he used to be working with a chain of schools in Punjab uh, for their improvement. And I started traveling with him to those schools. And in that journey, what occurred to me was that you know we used to play games like dumb charades, uh, pictionary, this and that. And I was like, you know, if how can we bring these games into these kids learning because they they don't seem to be having fun while mm. learning i was sitting in mm. those classrooms and the kids were bored out of their mind mm. <laughs> so i created a curriculum where we could assess their learning through games uh, this so is I, for uh, what uh, what uh, grade school. are you middle school, middle school okay. six seventh mm. eight and mm. i created this with smita because smita had taken a break by then and then we offered it to four schools and we took 20 kids out on this summer camp called beyond books uh, to see what happens. So, and people were, you know, I, I think because of my dad, they trusted that these guys would do something good. And this uh, was conceptualized from scratch. Huh? The yeah, yeah. I was sitting in the classroom. I was like, yeah, they're having less. It's so boring. And, uh, and we used to all play these games as uh, adults. And I was like, can I bring this, these games to these kids and help mm. them learn through them? I mean, it was just an idea. Mm. Then we pulled out all NCRT books of middle school, math and science and social studies, picked out the learning outcomes, designed clues for those games around it, and took these 20 kids to Dhalauzi. Uh, for how long? For a week. Wow. And at Just the end, two of you. These you kids didn't, have didn't staff, want to right? go back. You were still in sabbatical at that time. I was still in sabbatical, yeah. So me, Smita, my dad, and my mom, four of us took My mom is also a teacher. So the four of us took them, they stayed at a place uh, and when at the end of the week, the parents came to pick, the, the kids didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of Rona Dhona crying, but I just had such a good time. I, I can't, and life has come full circle, you know, mm. uh, one of those kids has joined us in, 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 wow. in wow. imagine, How phenomenal. Huh? It's, it's crazy. So. Yeah, I mean, I just had a lot. Of, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, you okay. know, I just want to make learning better because uh, the kids had so much fun. They learned a lot. We had so much fun. So yeah, I was clear. This is what I want to do. Uh, I think that was the transition from P out out of PNG then. I mean, so I, just I had to go back to PNG after sabbatical. Hmm. Hmm. They called me. They said it's a really good assignment. I went there, but I couldn't last more than a year. I just then quit. Acha, so you came, took the sabbatical. Uh, there was a very clear pathway ahead went back within a year uh, i went back because we hadn't earned enough to do what we loved even if we mm. don't uh, if it mm. if we didn't earn in right so we had mm. read that book reached that poor dad so there was a number we had to hit <laughs> mm. we didn't hit that number eventually but yeah i mean i went back after my sabbatical uh thinking i will do this for two more years but i couldn't last more than a year then i just quit understood and then you came back and uh, I was wanted to come back to India to start something on my own. Then somebody uh, who I knew, uh, knew that I wanted to do something in education. So he connected me to Subhash Chandra. Then mm -hmm. Subhash Chandra offered me to run his education company. And I felt that that's a, that's not a bad thing to do because I would be able to learn it and make impact at a scale, which I wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to do myself. So then I joined mm -hmm. Z Learn in 2007 end. Correct. And then talk to us about then from then. Yeah, and 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 Z Learn, I I mean, I learned a lot about education, the business of education. Uh, I think I was able to execute a lot of my ideas because ever since I knew it was education in two thousand five, I was reading a lot, so mm. I had formed some ideas on what we should be doing. So I was able to put them into action, and I think in the preschools and schools, uh, we did a lot of good stuff. I think the four years in five years in Z were great. I mean, we were able to get the company listed. It was uh, commercially very successful. Learning outcomes in those preschools and schools were really strong. I exited uh, Zlearn on a matter of principle uh, because there was some disagreement on how to deal with people. And I was, I think it was, I came to a point where I had to choose what I believed in my values versus uh, continuation. So I, I then left. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't on a good note, but I, I felt that was the right thing to do. Hmm. And meanwhile, just to understand, Smitha was still continuing in PNG uh, back in India. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the parallel track is that the day I decided to leave PNG, two days later, we realized that we were expecting our first child. So then I was like, have I made the right decision? <laughs> and I was in two minds because PNG was, of course, wanting me to stay. And uh, uh, I think at that time, Smitha stepped up and said, I think you should do what you want to. Uh, and uh, 
yeah, I mean, I think without her uh, backing, I, I don't think I would have been able to do it because it was a big step. Hmm. Uh, the and decision, she was in Singapore at that time, right? We were in Singapore. So the decision hmm. to move back, uh, then we said, okay, let's just go all in because we wanted to, of course, be together uh, mm. while Zoya was born. So we moved back to India. I joined Z. She continued with the PNG, but then we had Zoya. After maternity leave, she went back, joined PNG, but then she felt that mm. uh, PNG wasn't really uh, giving her enough reason to be away from Zoya. Mm. Uh, so she left. Uh, mm. And then we had Ane. Uh, so then 2010, uh, after Ane, Smita started to figure out what she wanted to do and she uh, saw how much fun I was having in education. So then she started a non-profit in education mm-hmm. where she was working with the municipal corporation schools in Bombay. Got it. And I think that's, I remember coming to an office on Linking Road or Khar. Uh, I think uh, you, she was probably operating out of her father's office or something. Was, was it uh, that? That, uh, that was I after I left Z. So after I left okay. Z, uh, okay. you know, basically I didn't leave Z on a good note. So mm. I was consumed by some sense of incompletion about the Z saga. And mm. I felt that I had to leave the past to where it belonged and really create mm. a clearing for the future. So I went for Vipassana uh, in 2012 after Z. And uh, when I came back from Vipassana, I became clear about two things that I wanted to do something on my own uh, and uh, now I wanted to take excellent education to small towns and underserved. I think that became clear because uh, Vipassana was a very intense experience and I got in touch with some things that, you know, maybe I had pushed mm. to the to the back mm. end. So when I came back from Vipassana, then I told Smita that this is what I would like to do, but uh, what do you want to do? She said, let's do it together. So that's when we set up lead. Wow. I think uh, we, we've sort of been in touch over the years, uh, Sumit. And one thing that really inspires me is just how together both of you are. You know, as when you when you see a husband and wife as co-founders, really breathing the mission and the vision and everything they do, it's, it's really inspiring. So it's, it's wonderful. Uh, and I think just maybe the last episode before we move to the other themes, even lead, I remember that being a little bit structured as a not-for-profit initially. I'm curious about... I think there was a transition from a, maybe uh, if I may, I'm not sure if I'm framing this right, but from a sort of a social impact kind of an organization to a f- pro- sort of a for-profit impact of an organization. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that transition? sure. See, I, I think the background is, uh, I mean, I, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad in 2004. And uh, I remember we went for a walk and I told Smita, like, how much do we need before we can start doing what we love? And we, mm-hmm. and we knew that, you know, if you have kids, we will have two kids. Uh, so we added up kids, their education, our, and we had a fairly simple lifestyle, all of that and said, I think if we, once we hit this number, at least I was clear, I want to quit and do what I, what I want to do. I didn't want to uh, mm-hmm. work mm-hmm. for money. Uh, so, and then what happened was uh, during my sabbatical, I realized that it's not difficult to earn money if you want, right? I mean, mm-hmm. the, the kind of experiences we've had, there are enough people who want to pay for it. So then I thought that we don't even have to wait till we hit this number, we can do it earlier. Uh, So when I left Z, uh, we were like, you know, we just, I think we have uh, enough now for our kids education and for the current lifestyle. So even if we don't make any money out of this, we'll be fine. We, we should do this because we want to do it and not worry about you know, when will we hit this number, that number and stuff. So we set up lead and Smita had run a non-profit. So she was also clear that she didn't want to run a non-profit because it had uh, the kind of talent you attract is very different. Mm. So we said, of course, we are going to set it up as a company, but I don't think we have a goal that this is the revenue we want to hit or this is the number. We just want to solve this one problem, which is how do we get excellent education to all kids? I mean, that's what we wanted to do. And even if you don't earn any money, it's fine. Uh, because we our basics had been taken care of. Hmm. So that's how LEAD got set up. We started with one school, then we opened five more schools. And then once those schools are doing well, then we got into this expansion phase. But when we began, uh, the goal was clear, but the path wasn't. Hmm. Hmm. And and what is it today? Maybe just to, just to bring the listeners up to date with the current uh, shape of your vision. 
Yeah, so uh, from 2012 to 2017, we basically ended up by starting first one school and then five schools of our own, which we still run. And today we serve 9,000 schools. So you moved from sort of running the school to taking the operating system. Yeah, to... So what happened was uh, my my dad used to say this. Uh, he he said once that you know you have this divine discontentment with the status quo. Mm. These are big words. He was an English professor. Of course, he used to say these things, but some divine things have stuck with me. So 2016, 17, and we were running these five schools. Uh, and again, most of our uh, realizations are on walks. So me and Smita were walking, and I was like, yeah, even if we continue on this journey in our lifetime, we're going to get to some 40, 50 schools. Mm. Uh, are you going to be happy with that level of impact? Uh, I'm not going to be happy. I, I want to make impact at a larger scale. And she was like, yeah, I think we should. Uh, and then we realized that uh, capital is not coming to uh, people who are running schools because we were running mm. affordable schools, right? And mm. we were running very high fee schools. Uh, they mm. are sitting on much larger margins. At the same time, uh, the same friend who I'm, who, uh, I'm meeting tomorrow, Boxer, his mm. family was running a school and they said, we've heard a lot of good things about your system. Can we use your system in our school? So I was like, Smita, maybe we can take the system to more schools because ultimately, if you want to improve quality of education, why do we have to run the school? There mm. are already so many schools who are mm. struggling. Let's just see if this system is of value to them. So we said in the first year, we'll try to reach out to 10 schools and see if they uh, want it. And uh, we went out and tried to raise a small round because we needed uh, money to reach out to those schools. So very surprisingly, 30 schools accepted in the first wow. year. And we were like, okay, there is something <laughs> clearly here. I think after we after that we just doubled down from 30 we went to 150 we went to 600 we went to 1600 and now it's uh, then 3000 then we acquired the Pearson company now it's 9000 so it's just kind of after wow. that snowball over five years and all these schools are in uh, uh, tier two tier three towns or are there some in cities as well I think, uh, the the 3000 that lead targets are 85 90 percent in tier two three four towns mm -hmm. uh, Pearson of course has a slight skew towards uh, higher fee schools, but majority of the schools where the lead system is working is in small towns. Hmm. Hmm. Hey, lovely, uh, Sumit. I wanted to, now that we've sort of done a sweep of your journey across time, I wanted to move to some of the other themes. Uh, one place where I've, I think I mentioned this to you as well, where I'm eternally grateful to you for is introducing me to the Landmark Forum sometime many years back. Uh, I think in a way that put me on a journey of self-awareness and in a way started a chain reaction, which got me to move away from search to doing what I do. And I think uh, I feel what I do now is much more aligned with who I am. So eternally grateful. And I think even in the way you mentioned the transition from Z to the next step, you said it in passing very, in a rushed way, clearing, you know, you had to go, you went away past and I did a clearing and you moved on. But it's such a profound thing, right? I tell people, if you want to write something new on the whiteboard, sometimes you need to erase what's on the board and then start writing. But I think more broadly, talk to us a little bit about your journey of self-awareness, Sumit, maybe from your childhood and some of the other things you might have done. Uh, I don't know how, but I think there is a sense instilled in me. I mean, and I haven't completely unpacked. Maybe it also comes from my dad. But with whatever happens in my life, I feel is my responsibility. And I don't blame others or circumstances. And in any situation, I'm focusing on, okay, so what do I need to do? I mean, mm. Stephen Kabi calls it right, the circle of influence. My dad used to call, say, don't focus, ke usne kya kiya, focus, ke tumhari duty kya hai. Mm. That, that sense. So I lost my dad in uh, December of 2009. Uh, and, uh, and I lost him to cancer. Uh, he was with us. So I was ridden with guilt and remorse for some time, right? And I just felt that, did I do enough? Could I have done something else? And I was just caught up in that. And it was a very low phase for me. So I began to look for ways to cope. Uh, mm. I I went for therapy. Uh, and then somebody told me about Landmark Forum. Mm. And I went there. And I just became aware of all the disabling patterns and the blind spots that were running my life. Uh, mm. And once I mm. tasted that power of being aware, I never mm. wanted to, you know, live this unthinking default life that you just kind mm. of, uh, with the flow, I wanted to live an intentional life in terms of, okay, so what do 
I want to do, what is the impact I want to make, what is the value I want to create, what is the... And then, then Vipassana followed once when the Z-Learn incident happened. Uh, so I've just kept up the practice because I feel that uh, in any situation, if I'm aware with what is happening inside me, uh, mm. then I'm able to be in control of what is happening outside me. Mm. A lot of it has to be internal. So I think that, again, I would say I'm fortunate that these opportunities have come and mm. and I have seen that they have worked for me and, and then just continuing that practice has really, really helped. Yeah. Mm. Is there an ongoing practice you have? Uh, either, uh... Yeah, see, now... Uh, now the the place I'm in is that I'm able to catch myself. Uh, mm. The two emotions that are very debilitating are uh, anger and fear, right? Uh, mm. And and nowadays fear is more about our identity than any physical fear. So just mm. becoming aware that okay, you know, this is what is happening, mm. and then having a simple uh, mechanism to overcome it is actually very helpful. So. And it doesn't take more than five breaths or five seconds of mindfulness to know this is happening and then snap out of it or bounce back. Uh, so I think that's the practice. Nani, lovely. Uh, very simply put, but it uh, takes uh, years to get in, in the sense it's, it's uh, I guess, an ongoing pursuit. And uh, the other the other question I had on self-awareness was in my work, I noticed very often and going back to Landmark Forum, one of the things that really stayed with me was actually in the first session you know, the uh, the the facilitator, I think it was a gentleman called Gurmeet Singh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he drew a pie chart and he said, what you know about yourself is like some 2%. And he shared it and he said, everything else is unknown. And in the landmark forum, very often the, the popcorn will pop in the 98%, not in the 2%. And that was like profound. I didn't realize the wisdom then, but later in the work, I've come to realize that very often one is sort of, if I may, meditating our way to self-awareness. The other is a little bit of taking in feedback and sort of listening to the whispers. Very often feedback also doesn't come in loud voices. Especially in a uh, as a founder of a large organization, I'm curious to understand sometimes because of the power dynamics, it's sometimes hard to get true feedback. What's been your, uh, what's been your journey of uh, processing outside in feedback? Not just from the organization, but in general, you know? I think you rightly said that uh, I have I have come to realize that very often we know the truth, uh, mm. but we don't want to listen to it. Uh, there is a there is almost always a voice in our head which we sometimes call gut or intuition, mm. which we don't pay heed to because we are just so caught up in uh, managing our external perception or managing our fear or wondering about what others would think of us, and we just shove our like the voice in the head on the side. Mm. Uh, and I have learned that if I listen to it, uh, more often than not, uh, mm. it guides you in the right direction. Uh, like if, if you have, for example, uh, a bad hiring, mm. uh, or if you've made a wrong decision, or if somebody had has made a proposal very forcefully uh, in a large group, and you agree, but in, in the gut, you, you know there is something wrong then I have learned to just follow that, that, okay, mm. there is something, uh, there is something uh, not making sense. Let me just now try to figure out why is it not making mm. sense versus mm. saying, okay, nah, yaar, it's okay. You know, some, so just listening to that voice and trusting your intuition, uh, is, is, is one way I have found, which basically ensures that, you know, the things are real. You don't mm. get caught up because there's a lot of ways in, in, which you can get caught up because mm. like you rightly said, after you achieve a certain scale, there are enough people who want to surround you. Uh, and then you do lose touch with reality. Mm. Uh, but, but keeping your just sens sensibility open to listening to when that soft voice says and following where it is leading you is very, mm. important. very powerful. If I may, if I may relate to that, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, in my in my journey in the last seven, eight years as a coach on a sounding board, initially I would get taken in by the title and the role and the sort of, if I may say, the prestige of the assignment. But after some time, you start listening to say, all that is great, but I'm not enjoying the conversation. <laughs> yeah. so I've started leaning into saying, after the first couple of meetings, am I getting energy from the conversation? 
and then sort of trying to bring that into the decision mix as well so very very uh, very well said and it takes time and, and as, as you rightly say we may not have language for it but very often the heart speaks to us it's it's so, our job to pause and decipher what it's trying to say uh, and and you know one of the coping mechanism and you know, i have had imposter syndrome growing up and i don't think i've I, mean, i don't think one can fully recover from it but what i've realized is that very often uh, हम अपने आप को समझा लेते हैं लाइक वी जस्ट वी नो इट इज नॉट राइट बट बिकॉज वी डोंट हैव द सेल्फ कॉन्फिडेंस वी ट्रेन टू लिसन टू अ वॉइस ऑफ अथॉरिटी और समबडी एल्स एंड स्टफ एंड लेटर वी रियलाइज यार वी न्यू दिस वाई डिड वी नॉट एंड नाउ आई हैव डिसाइडेड नॉट एंड आई एम नॉट सक्सेसफुल एट ऑल फुल्ली बट इन इन सम इंस्टेंसेज आई एम एबल टू से इट्स ओके इफ फॉर एग्जाम्पल आई डोंट फील लाइक गोइंग फॉर दिस गैदरिंग पीपल माई थिंक दैट यू नो आई एम बींग अ सोशल और स्टफ बट इट्स ओके बिकॉज मे बी दिस इज वेयर द ग्लैडनेस ऑफ माई हार्ट इज एंड इट्स ओके द मोमेंट यू स्टार्ट सेंग इट्स ओके टू योर सेल्फ अ लॉट मोर वर्स इज सेंग अरे वाई डज इट हैपन विद मी अरे वाई एम आई लाइक दिस एंड स्टफ यू स्टार्ट टू बी इन अ गुड स्पेस वेरी ट्रू take i mean goes back to your point about taking responsibility right once you yeah. take responsibility take full responsibility right uh-huh. and uh, <laughs> and then solve for resonance ki yaar theek hai main i'm sleeping well at night and i exactly. on my term, on my terms you know and i was talking to an investor earlier today actually he said yaar my fund might fail but i will go to sleep saying ki theek hai yaar mera conviction tha i played that game according to my conviction and i sort of Uh, whatever i i fell flat but at least i know that i didn't play somebody else's game i played my game okay. right so yeah. any very true the other piece i wanted to explore sumit uh, was uh, see you you have two young kids i think the cusp of going to college uh, both you and smith are co-founders uh, i'm one of the at least hypotheses i have is all of us need to have space for doing something we love right in our life so, some people a lucky to find it in their work and in a way uh, and what you love in a way the way i the simple way that i try to understand it is it energizes you rather than drains you T- tell us a little bit about uh, how you found space for what you love either in the work you do or otherwise give us a sense of of the various things you do what all energizes you <clears throat> yeah. i think at this point i am not doing anything which drains me uh, mm. my work my love are the same so that's a blessing like to i mean i i just feel that it is really a blessing and for you also to to first know what you love doing and then being able to do it very true uh, and then if i may, if i may come in briefly one of my guests actually said one of the wrapping up questions i ask is yeah what does the term play to potential mean to you he said the answer is in the title you can't work to your potential you can only play to your potential right it has to feel like play right? it has to feel like play and you know the the wonderful thing is that then to be also have someone pay you for it and you know mm. it's just like <laughs> it's a blessing it's just too good to be true uh so yeah i mean i have in the last 11 years ever since we started lead i don't recall a day where i have like are yaar i am i just feel that the day is not enough hmm uh, 11 pm or 12 pm 12 midnight when i'm going to bed i'm like oh there's so much more to do when i wake up For, uh, mm. one hour before i wake up i think i'm buzzing with ideas and one hour after i go to bed there are still so it's just so mm. all consuming uh, uh so so yeah i, I think the one uh, thing ha huh, the one thing if i may probe there uh, sumit is uh, very often uh, i see people who are passionate about a mission um, but the mechanics of getting to it you know for example teaching is one thing but building a school dealing with investors negotiating dealing with attrition firing hiring you know sometimes the the day to day elements of work can be draining while the mission is energizing how have you uh, sort of uh, how is that played out uh, in your journey you know this uh, i mean i don't know whether you and me had this conversation but with a lot of friends we've had this conversation about journey destination right what is more important i have realized that there's a third element right which is your uh, partner mm-hmm. so i think it's the it's at the intersection of these three things it's neither, neither of uh, like of these three things are complete by themselves the journey is important the destination is important and your co uh, partner is very important and uh, i mean i honestly 
whether it is uh, hiring somebody firing somebody making a tough decision uh, doing the so called boring stuff all of it is uh, in the service of what we want to achieve right mm. so i i don't i don't see them as separate layers i see them mm. as threads of the same fabric so mm. therefore uh, one doesn't have its existence without the whole mm. therefore it has not hit me and then having smita is just it just makes it very joyful uh, mm. like we were traveling to delhi and i told her that you know, when we are work traveling for work after 8 pm it stops feeling like work mm. uh, so yeah i think i keep saying that you know it's difficult to be so fortunate and i i think <laughs> i am <laughs> and it's wonderful man wonderful uh, as i said uh the 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 degree of resonance that i see uh, between the two of you is really inspiring uh, uh and and in your in your experience what does it take to make that work if i may slightly changing topics let's say co-founders who are spouses uh if you had to sort of draw the curtains uh open <laughs> the curtains rather if i'm honest with you i think i the best thing i've done is was to pursue smita and get her as my life <laughs> I mean, uh she is the single biggest reason that you know we've been able to do well in in the four things in our life and the four things are i think lead our kids us and our parents hmm. uh and you know hmm. our parents are truly our parents i mean it's not like her parent my parent and i don't think it it was possible without her and lead would not be at this scale and impact without her uh hmm. so in in that sense yeah that was one good decision i made uh hmm. and it worked out and the reason i think it is successful you know if you ask me because a lot of people actually have asked because it seems like uh, people feel that you know being uh, partners in life and co-founders is is not easy for us uh, i think there are three things that actually work one is we, we love each other a lot and we are very good friends uh, so there is absolute trust and no insecurities uh, mm. in fact we don't crave a company beyond each other uh, and that might be like mushy and syrupy but that's true i mean uh, that's how it is with us so we are very good we're friends still, we are still in the valentines day zone so i think it's oh yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> so that so that i think is the first factor second i think we we respect each other a lot for our strengths as both a person and professional and mm-hmm. it happened because me and smita worked with each other in png before mm-hmm. we actually got into a relationship right so i know what she's good at she knows what i'm good at and thankfully it is very complimentary very mm. common so that uh, helps because you know uh, love sometimes i feel is not enough for you to work together you also have to respect the other person for mm. what they bring to the table mm. uh, that is the sec- th- second thing the third thing actually uh, is the other dimension which actually has come in because of our self awareness work is that both of us are also acutely aware of our own shortcomings mm. so we are aware of the fact that we are very different people early in our relationship you know uh, it used to be expecting the other to change then mm. it moved to accepting the other and now it is at a place where we are celebrating our differences ki yaar hare ye mai ye to tum better karte ho like you know it's it's at a level where if you know you're not good at something and somebody else is better uh, then that pull gets created so okay. I, i think these are three things which is really uh, maybe the magic is at the intersection of love respect and being aware of your own shortcomings hmm. uh, uh, hmm. but so i think that's how now it's not all, always uh, great i mean there are challenges there are uh, tensions stresses but those are what what normally happens that you know unmet expectations or unexpected hmm. emotions the good thing is that we are able to bounce back quickly uh, we hmm. don't wallow in it for long enough hmm. and i mean on one hand you're solving the future of thousands if not millions of kids right and on the other hand you have two kids at home how do you uh, given given the intensity of life as founders how do you what's been your how have you ensured uh, you know uh, time with family with the kids especially because smita to khair as as part of running lead in even otherwise i guess there's enough overlap uh, curious about the kids portion I think what what has helped is that we have not we have <clears throat> decided that we are co-founders not only at work but also at home. Uh, so it's not like uh, Smita has to do one point five and I have to do point uh, five. Mm. It is I don't think it is one one. It is maybe point nine and one point one on her side. Uh, but still, I think uh, 
that actually ensures that we are able to quickly like maneuver very quickly i mean it's there's a nice flow that if mm. for example there is something to be done at zoya or ane's end and smita is busy busy with something then i would come in and if i am busy she would come in so there is uh, that flow between personal professional uh, mm. is is very easy and because i we don't see that home is smita and work is me and uh, yeah that has helped second i think what has helped is that we have reduced our the things that we are focusing on like for example some like i told you earlier somebody told me sometime some years back that there are four chambers in your heart so you can do four things in life mm. and you have to be you should be in, if you are intentional about it then you can do them well without guilt Mm. Currently, those four things are lead, our kids, the two of us, and our parents in that order. Mm. Uh, so, therefore, uh, we are doing very few things, just those four. But hopefully, we are able to do them well, and we, then we don't do others. And now we not we are able to not do others and say no to those without mm. guilt. But yeah, that I think is it. That's very powerful. Yeah, I think time is finite, and it's very easy to clutter the plate. with many things yeah. and uh, and then feel guilt and or feel not having time or being stressed or snapping you know all those so uh, that's profound four four things i'll remember <laughs> uh not really i mean i'm just reconciling with another four things that i learned learned from another uh, gentleman called stew friedman he talks about four things self work home and community right i think self work uh, work and home is like the first circle the community is like the bigger circle uh so it's in uh, and i was just curious uh, the, there wasn't any self in that uh, so i, I was wondering the third, if the third chamber of us is, is uh, that and we we kind of you right we move in and out because uh, there are fire gazing times which is for me and then there is us community mm. i think is missing today uh, mm. if you ask me because It, See, it is just work mm. and maybe work mm. is also community but there's work there's kids there's us and there's parents because they are at a certain mm. age but those are the four things beyond which even community to be fair the way he defines it is about making a difference beyond your circle which is work colleagues or home so okay. by the nature of your mission you are yeah, i think in a way, in a way you are uh, taking that box uh, maybe social relationships and sort of some of those things probably time uh, yeah. maybe that that's a different discussion uh, <laughs> uh uh the other theme i'm curious about uh, is how people's uh, aspiration emerges over time right uh, there was a time when my aspiration was to do well in a certain exam or to get this job and this and that and then as life evolves it uh, you know it uh, it takes a shape of its own across the various across the four chambers if i may right so if, if, can you talk a little bit about how that's also evolved over time for you Uh, i think growing up till till i went to png uh, mm. i would say in my life uh, i went through the first 16 years of bliss uh, where you know everything was i think easy because i was doing well in college in school getting a lot of recognition so it there was mm. no issue then i went through a period of 6 7 years maybe where i felt a very high sense of inadequacy so Uh, it had to be overcome with the uh, wanting recognition and stuff mm. uh, then i think when i uh, when i met smita mm. uh, that went away because you know when you when you feel when you get love you also get acceptance right mm. uh, and then you feel that a lot of the things that you were fighting for were actually stupid it, not worth it right because uh, you are okay as you are you didn't have to be someone else Uh, mm. when, and a lot of the insecurity and issue is that only right the gap between what you pretend to be and what you are really are and the moment you become okay with who you really are it just goes away mm. and love mm. actually does a really good job of getting you comfortable with who you are at least in my uh, mm. case it happened so after I, i we went to singapore we got married uh, some of the, those personal issues went away and then i started wondering about okay so from a sense of unfairness to a sense of purpose like what hmm and that is where the png journey uh, kind of got into okay what am i really doing here and stuff hmm. Hmm. i think since then it has only been focused on how do i leave this world a better place than i inherited and this hmm. started from 2003 hmm. 
uh, it began as a question and and since then i think what has happened is that uh, i found my calling in education so now i have it's been 17 18 years i've nursed this dream of transforming indian education hmm. uh, and uh, i just find the idea that you know 270 million students are not going to grow up to their full potential i find it heartbreaking they spend 8 hours a day in school uh, so that nursery that playground is so full of possibilities right uh, hmm. i think hmm. that is the aspiration that has remained now for the last 18 years of course the scale of that aspiration has expanded it's like you know i think we spoke about this when you go on a hike uh, as you reach one peak then you say are there is another peak and there is yes. another peak so that yes. is happening now yes uh, and i feel that going deeper is actually making the opportunity seem wider uh, but yeah since the last 18 years the aspiration is yeah to just see if we can do something about how the kind of education kids get and how can mm. they can reach their true potential hmm and i loved what you said right i think uh, one of the themes i've noticed is pur- the notion of purpose is often emergent right it's not on day one you don't quite know this is my grand purpose very often yeah. i i tell people you know asking somebody what's your purpose is a bit like asking a 6 year old beta tumko kya banna hai right yeah, it's, as, it's, <laughs> it's as challenging as that or yeah. as bizarre as that question right so uh, in your can you expand on that i mean uh, back to the trek metaphor right when you get to a certain goal post you see the next peak uh, and so on can you talk to us a little bit about even within this world of education how has the nature of the aspiration shifted yeah i think even if i like i would like to take a step back and first uh, i don't know whether you watched watch the movie tamasha i haven't actually you must watch it uh, and and i resonate every time i watch the movie i cry because i resonate so well Uh, with the movie and i think the whole idea is that again going back to the i thought of listening to the uh, voice because mm. it tells you where the gladness of your heart is it tells you but you are so consumed by society's pressure expectations your own treadmill uh, comparison with other people and stuff that you don't listen to it mm-hmm. and for me i think again like i said uh, uh, fortunate that i could take that sabbatical and then follow what where it was leading me uh, and to me the biggest which was that just making mm. this a decision that i don't care whether i earn money or not i don't care whether this much is enough now i want to do what i love and even if i don't earn money i'll be okay and i've found that when you don't chase money it comes to you hmm uh, completely agree completely agree uh, you know the metaphor in my head is that of a butterfly right you can't catch it but when you sit and meditate it sort of land on your shoulder easy. right i think uh, yeah yeah uh, you've used the term three or four times already i'm curious uh, gladness of my heart what do you mean by that uh... see uh, in png i went through a period where i wasn't happy hmm. doing what i was doing i was doing well uh, so uh, but you know i don't know it's, it's uh, i mean you've, you've heard of the idea of flow right when you hmm. lose sense of time you just hmm. doing it you having so much fun Hmm. that is where the gladness of your heart lies right when you have like the beyond book summer camp is is alive in my memory we had so much fun uh, hmm. so i think once you get it then you don't want to lose it because you know you're like why would i do anything else hmm. uh, so so yeah yeah i i just wish more people hmm. find it very very true possible. very true and also this uh... you know i also personally relate to this point of if i may if i may i, I didn't grow up in a small town like you did but coming from chennai <clears throat> when i met people from bombay and delhi and some of our classmates have been to world debating championships when you sit in the same classroom <laughs> <laughs> you say by the time you raise your hand some 10 points have been made so uh, at the point about inadequacy i think finally i've come to realize that first we need to feel adequate with ourselves and then uh, it's possible to come alive very often uh, in the journey of just proving one's adequacy just uh, life yeah. life uh, passes by uh, true and then very powerful um the other, the other uh, theme i'm curious about is just uh, uh, when i look at people who are thriving um, there's an element of investment in if i may say intangible assets right it's not it's not just about 
you know, that there are sprinters and there are marathoners. And there's very clearly, when you look around, you see some people who are huffing and puffing and you know that it's not sustainable. Something's going to give. But, you know, some people, they they live life in a way which seems that they can play the long game with this approach. How have you, and when I say personal, if I may say personal balance sheet, whether it's skills, whether it's your health, whether it's when you've already spoken a little bit about inner work, talk to us a little bit about how you ensure that this stays a marathon or not a sprint that consumes you. Uh, I haven't thought about it in that in those terms, but now that you ask, see, I think uh, one thing is that uh, when something bothers me, uh, mm -hmm. my natural gravitation is towards thinking about what can I do about it. Mm. Uh, and then that points me to, okay, so I need to learn something about it. Uh, mm. Like when, when I got into education, uh, I read a lot about it. Mm. Uh, I went to uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education for a course. I must have visited some two, three hundred schools all over the country, wherever the US, huh? there, who runs, yeah, across the country wow. and even internationally, because I just wanted to know what does excellence look like before I can mm. do something about it. Mm. Uh, so what I've realized is that whenever I'm trying to do something uh, which I don't know, I don't assume that I know. I just mm. get in, learn to figure out what excellence looks like and then try to contextualize it to which, whichever place. So I think that has helped. Has helped. Uh, now today we've got a model, but like I'm always traveling and visiting schools, sitting mm. in classrooms, observing teachers or even teaching uh, because that mm keeps me grounded to know That's what is really happening the in the classroom mm. because ultimately the magic is in the classroom. We can design whatever sitting in Bombay. Ultimately, if it doesn't translate in the teacher student interaction or in the student's experience, it's not going to make a difference. Mm. So just uh, continuously thinking about how things can be better and and just working towards it, I think is definitely one area. And the second area is I also keep think playing out alternate versions of the future in my mind mm. and mm. keep preparing for it. like if AI has come in, what will happen or if homeschooling, what will happen? Mm. Keep playing out alternate scenarios of the future and keep preparing for it so that, uh, that when that's where innovation mm. and learning kind of comes from. So, uh, yeah, mm. yeah. And I don't know whether it means it's, uh, I think of it as a marathon. I think it is, it, my sense is it comes from the dissatisfaction with the status quo, you know, just keep mm. on focusing mm. on how it can be better mm. and learning and doing it. I guess the given the size of the problem, right, it's easy to sometimes get burnt out when you take on a, a problem of this magnitude and scale. There's no end to how, how much you push yourself. So how do you, I guess the question I'm asking is, how do you ensure that uh, your health is not compromised in this process, right? A very simple question, right? Uh, to, Three years back, I think, uh, again, one of those walks, uh, <laughs> I, me and Smitha were discussing and I said, I don't see this problem getting solved in our lifetime. Mm. Uh, because, you know, 270 <clears throat> million kids will get to 50 million, maybe, uh, if you are mm. uh, lucky. Uh, so I think now our focus should shift on building an organization which will continue to do this work mm. after us. Mm. Uh, and, you know, uh, some of the principles you've learned in build to last or good to great, whatever it is are very fundamental. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we really think about uh, culture and values and in mm -hmm. the organization? Because when we are not in the room, people have to be making decisions which will further the mission. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the moment you come to that realization, at least when we came to that realization, A, there, there was like a burden which got lifted. Because what it told us was that our job has shifted from solving the problem to creating the vehicle to solve the problem and it's mm. very different mindset suddenly right uh, so that i think helped and then uh, we started working towards it uh, now to a specific point about health and stuff again it's about listening to your body listen mm. uh, i uh, and i'm wearing this <laughs> i was going to go there <laughs> after covid uh, we realized that both me and smitha and actually our whole leadership team had become unfit because you know we're just sitting and so 2023, uh, I still have that piece of paper. I We made a resolution as a leadership team that, uh, and all of us had teenage kids. So the first resolution mm -hmm. was, we'll help our kids find the gladness of their heart. Wow. Uh, 
second was we will become fitter mm. uh, and then the other three were more organizational goals uh, and then we committed to it and for the whole year i think we've just invested in our health to become fitter because we realized that our bodies was were telling us that the amount of work and stress we were putting on it was not sustainable so i think it's about listening to your to your inner voice body and then doing something about it. because very often we listen but then we just crib and stop mm. it's interesting you said i mean also as a father of two young children uh, what's what's your take on getting the kids to find the gladness of the heart you're an educator and you have kids so your your perspectives are uh, priceless i think it's similar uh, to what we did that uh no kid would know for from the beginning mm. some might but very few kids actually know right so you've got to expose them to different experiences mm. and then listen carefully where mm. they are they are doing stuff without you telling them to mm. because that's where the gladness of heart is right uh, mm. if you have to tell them that oh you've not attended this class you've not done your assignment you've not this then it means that there is no pull you are pushing but when you are telling the kid that hey you should go to bed now stop Hmm. you know that there is flow hmm. uh, so as a parent i think there are only two jobs one is exposure and second is listening hmm. uh, and then the moment you find the match uh, you go deep now the interesting thing with kids is in with adults when you go deep you know you've achieved it with kids kids are also changing hmm. so that might not last so you hmm. have to just keep doing it uh, that's the interesting complexity interesting the other uh, school of sorry we are digressing here but it's a helpful uh, the other school of thought often is sometimes kids also don't know what they like they have to go through a phase of probably not liking something and then maybe across the hump lies flow do you believe in that school of thought where you you need to go through a phase of displeasure or grunt before you see uh, flow on the other side is there any merit to that line of thinking See, there's a framework in my mind that for a child to be successful, there are some basics that they need, hmm. uh, and I would push the child uh, only if those basics are not there. Uh, hmm. But beyond that, I've and I think now all of us have learned that if they don't have their heart in it, they're not going to be doing it to their full potential. I mean, you can. I mean, if Sachin had practiced hundred hours of music, he would have been able to sing, but he would not have become Lata Mangeshkar. Hmm. So there is that, there is that uh, uh, I'm reading this book called uh, the the blank slate and it fifty hmm. percent of it is genes so you just have to be in a discovery mode uh, and then hmm. the other forty odd percent is parenting where you hmm. have to do, uh, do the stuff so yeah I I don't completely subscribe to that fact with you with you I mean I was I remember reading a book called Range I don't know if you've written I read a book called Range. where he talks about a uh, tiger woods approach and a roger federer approach and the crux of what he says tiger woods was playing golf from the age of 3 and just uh, fight mar mar ke he got to the top roger federer was dabbling with a few things soccer ye wo uh, skiing etc and then around age 11 12 or whatever he said okay tennis and then he picked tennis and then he rose to the top and the, the crux of the argument he says is if you start at very early then there's a risk of climbing the wrong tree you know that mm. the odds of a tiger woods are low you might uh, end up pushing hard and then not seeing not seeing flow on the other side so you were saying to your point you were saying exposed to a diverse diverse set of things and then see whether there's traction and then double down or yeah. evolve uh, got it got it i think just a couple of things before we wrap up uh, sumit uh, as you know uh, i'm sort of using flavor as an organizing uh, uh language uh family love aspiration how we think of value and find opportunity and investing in ourselves and relationships where in 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 this journey where have you found tension you know i also realize that we can't have everything all the time so what where have you felt the tension uh in your journey you briefly was speaking about it before we started recording but i'd love for you to talk about that yeah you you right i think i don't think all the letters of flavor are alive at every point in yes in life but uh, if you if i just take the metaphor of a marathon for you to be able to complete it uh, some letter has to be alive at some part of, of the course. marathon otherwise it will not be like a successful uh, marathon so in my case uh, like if you ask me today uh, the relationship letter is not alive i mean i i mm. know for a fact that 
I'm not investing time with my siblings, uh, with my friends. Um, mm. And it is in, I've had to make it intentional for it to be guilt free. Mm. Uh, because for some time it was uh, guilt and I and I often say that, you know, guilt is very dangerous because it gives you the illusion of action without any impact being made. Mm. So it's better to not do it. But uh, and then in the beginning, early years, uh, family wasn't really big because, you know, I was trying to find myself. So I had to break mm. free. Uh, but now because of my parents, family is back. So, yeah, I think you you go in and out. Uh, fortunately, the middle part, which is, you know, loving what you do, uh, being in tune with your aspiration, uh, value and investing in yourself, those things uh, mm. have been, uh, again, fortunate that they have been alive. And maybe they are also the contributing factors where uh, we've been able to last this long pursuing what we love without, you know, actually mm. be facing any of the issues that we spoke about, whether mm. it is burnout or, you know, feeling mm. this. So the the F and R, I would say, are a little low at this point, but the other letters are are, are alive, and it that has been different at different points. Of course, of, time. of course, and that's at least I believe. Uh, at least when look around, uh, I I don't see too many people that have ticked everything at the same time, but finally it's a it's an act of juggling and prioritizing as we go through life. Just as we wrap up, uh, Sumit, it's been a, it's been a wonderful conversation. Uh, uh, if you could be immodest. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, talk a little bit about if I had to say, you know, this this conversation or the series of conversations about leading a full life, not just one dimensional life, right? What's what's been uh, what's been your approach? What 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 are some things you keep back of your mind as you walk this path so that you lead a you lead a full life? Uh, I. I think my my learning is that uh, in order for us to lead a full life. Uh, the first step is to be okay with who you are, uh, because unless we are at peace with ourselves, uh, you can't find peace outside, right? Uh, I think George Bernard Shaw wrote, and my dad used to quote that I myself am hell and I carry hell about me. Hmm. Uh, and it was his way of saying that unless you are at peace with yourself, you're going to make everyone around uh, not be at peace. Uh, and I think my journey of uh, discovering what I love and being able to pursue uh, that actually has been lock, step and barrel with my journey of being okay with myself. Because like I told you, I think uh, this whole overcoming this sense of inadequacy, the f the feeling that the world is unfair, uh, that the world owes me something. It was very important for me to overcome that. Uh, because if you don't have, uh, if you're so consumed with yourself, you don't have space for others. So this clearing that you have to create for others to show up doesn't even exist because it's so full of your fears and anxieties and, mm. and anger. So in that sense, I think the work on self-awareness on myself has been very instrumental in uh, allowing me the possibility of living a full life. So that was, I think that is one big part, uh, being okay with yourself. Second is just listening to the voice in your head and not being consumed by what the society expects you. Hmm. Because, uh, and I'm sure you would have faced it, but I definitely faced it when I was wanting to make the transition back from Singapore to India, yes. uh, when I was wanting to lead, leave Z and start up lead. A lot of people who wished well for me uh, thought I was being stupid. Uh, and they said as much uh, to me on my, sometimes on my face and sometimes behind my back. Uh, but I think at that time, uh, knowing that in the long term, I will bring them aboard, but in the short term, I have to listen to my heart was very important because if I had gotten caught up with what my father or mother was saying, my siblings were saying, my friends were saying, I would not have been able to do it. So you've got to listen. Very often, and to that point, very often they're extrapolating their anxieties, their fears, or their, yeah. their ambition for you, whatever, right? Whatever it yeah. is, it's their projection. It's often exactly. uh, can be different from what you have in mind for yourself. True. And and you need to have the uh, the confidence that in the long term they will come on board. It's not mm. because you know at every point in your life everybody doesn't have to be on board because they are at different places. So you just you just need to have that patience. Ki hai, you know, mm. and mm. it happens uh, that they they frankly finally come on board. So that is the uh, second thing. And I think the third thing is that I believe that in leading a full life you've got to 
commit to something bigger than yourself mm. uh, because if you are consumed by yourself it's not a full life it's a very small life uh, mm. but if you commit to something bigger than yourself then your personal issues disappear because there's so much such a larger thing to go for those are the three things that i would say have have helped wonderful man that's a it's a wonderful synthesis of uh, this conversation so me thank you so much for uh, taking the time it's it's uh it's wonderful to reconnect in this avatar but i truly enjoyed it and learned a lot from it thank you thanks thanks a lot for this i i always believe that you know when we have such conversation it just forces you to think about things that you do but you don't think about mm. uh, so in that sense it's uh, yeah, it's very uh, refreshing <laughs> to to have this conversation so thanks for thanks for doing that many nee, absolutely man thank you all right take care yeah. A couple of things struck me about my conversation with Sumit. One is the phrase he uses, "Listen to the gladness of your heart." I find it such a simple statement but it's such a profound one in terms of playing to our potential. In the book, I outline some of the simple things we can do to cultivate the heart muscle. I notice that very often it's not a listening problem, but the fact that we haven't worked on our heart muscle for us to listen to our heart. The second is a point he makes about not having it all. in the context of the flavor framework even in the way i described the framework it's not about saying we have each of the elements of flavor f l a v o u and r ticked that's not the point it's about being deliberate and intentional about some of the trade offs and just walking with a sense of purpose and direction and being very intentional sumit is one of the six people we've profiled as part of the flavorful life series if you found this conversation useful you might find some of the other conversations helpful as well If you want deeper insights on reinventing yourself, doing inner work, listening to your heart and adapting and being intentional about some of your choices, do consider picking up the book Play to Potential. The link in the description has details on where you can find the book. Thank you for listening. Thank you.